excited to see you all joining us today. We are going to hang out for just a minute or two to make sure that everyone can join and get settled in. So make sure to grab a snack, maybe a beverage, just get comfy for what is going to be a great hour together. I'm coming to you from Bozeman, Montana, where it really can't decide if it's spring or not yet. Uh, we have had snow, rain, 70 degrees, and sunshine. It's really been a roller coaster. Ryan, how are you? How's your week going? I'm doing great. Yeah, as we were just talking about, I'm super excited about Friday because I'm feeling that those fall springs and super excited for the 70 degree day that's on the horizon. Yeah. How about you? Great. We at XYPN just celebrated our eight year birthday on Monday. So did you do anything to observe, Ryan? <laughs> Uh, I took the day off. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if that's the proper way to observe, but yeah, I, I, was, I uh, definitely celebrated in my own way. Perfect. Yes, it was a it's a very fun thing to have been here for a couple years now and get to see these big milestones. It's really exciting. Absolutely. Perfect. All right. Well, it is just past the hour, so I'm going to get us started. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Amy Arno, and I am a lead business development specialist on the XYPN sales team. Today, I am thrilled to host this webinar, How to Intentionally Build and Foster a Positive Company Culture with XYPN Chief People Officer Ryan Watton. I do want to point out just a few housekeeping options on the right. The top tab that you see is the chat function and below that is the Q&A module. So if you do have any questions for Ryan throughout the presentation, please submit them there. We will also do a few polls today. So when you are prompted, please go to the third tab on the right to answer any of the questions that we have for you. One last quick reminder, we do host these free webinars every month, so be sure to register for next month's webinar on May 11th, How to Be Your Own Chief Investment Officer for Your Fee-Only Firm with Jeff Snodgrass, the Director of XY Investment Solutions, and we will post a link in the chat to register for that. So that's it for me. Ryan, I will now turn it over to you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Amy. And thanks for that wonderful introduction. Super excited to be here and really just get the opportunity to be in a room full of other folks who are also thinking about culture and really want to be intentional in their journeys as they move along. We have quite a bit to talk about today. And so before I really introduce myself, I wanted to take a few poll questions. Uh, and with Amy's help, we'll launch those here shortly. It's four questions in total, and certainly just really want to get an idea of kind of how you're experiencing culture, how culture maybe is impacting you now, and really just get us all on the same page as we navigate this topic together. So my first question that I'm going to be asking is to let us know if you have ever worked in a toxic workplace. So as Amy mentioned, those polls can be accessed on the top right corner of the screen, three icons down. And so, yeah, let us know if you have worked in a toxic workplace. If you're currently working in a toxic workplace, if you've worked in a toxic workplace before, or if you've never worked in a toxic workplace. Awesome. So for those of you who maybe have never worked in a toxic workplace, I would best define that as a hostile work environment. That can be hostile emotionally, it can be hostile mentally, physically, uh, if you feel like your well-being or wellness isn't being spoken to. Certainly, if you feel like a number or if you feel like a cog in the machine, those are all signs of a toxic workplace. Awesome. Just give you a few more moments to get that in there. Great. So yeah, not a really big surprise here. We are seeing a lot of folks have experienced that with a good amount of us actually currently in a toxic workplace. And so that definitely speaks to culture. And so throughout this presentation, you're gonna see a lot of data, you're gonna see a lot of measurables. And I love that. And so you should expect that throughout the presentation. So as it pertains to a toxic workplace, the most common reason workers quit during the Great Resignation was toxic company culture. And so that's about a third of the millions of people we saw quit this year. And so for those of you who maybe are not familiar with the Great Resignation, ultimately that was a concept that came out about this time last year. And ultimately it was a prediction that we were gonna see millions, record numbers of folks 
quitting their jobs. And ultimately this prediction came to fruition. And so when we look at January of 2022 alone, for example, that's 7 million people who left their jobs. That's about double what we would have seen in any January prior. We're seeing that on the months before and the months after as well. As an aside, we also saw that 11 million jobs went out in January alone. So this really speaks to the supply and demand issue that we're all having with the workforce currently. So I wanted to keep that top of mind as we think about culture uh, internally. So we'll switch gears here and go to the next poll. Can you let us know if you have ever stopped doing business with a company because of their values? And so same thing, those polls can be accessed on the top right corner. This is a little bit easier, it's just a yes or no. And certainly this is something that I think that we're seeing more in the, previous, in the last decade. And that's ultimately, I think, for two reasons, right? One is we have a lot more choices than we had 60 years ago. For example, if we wanted to buy meat, we just went down to the local butcher shop. Now there's about 50 different grocery stores in any given radius. And on top of that, we can get meat directly delivered to our door from corners around the world. So that's the first main reason. I'd say the second reason is really just this, this old adage that one person can make a difference is starting to feel less and less attainable, certainly to the incoming generations. And so where they have been able to move the needle is really with their buying power and their impact. So this is something that we're seeing and certainly something that we um, we're expecting to continue. So we'll just give a few more moments for folks to finish out those polls. Yeah, and not a big surprise, those numbers are really close to what we're seeing across the country. So 71% of consumers prefer buying from companies aligned with their values. And so just really wanted to take a moment to highlight that your culture has impact both internally and externally. So thanks for your perspective on that. My third of four questions is to let us know if you are more productive and engaged when you're excited about your work. Again, these are just yes or no answers. So we'll give you some moments to chat about those and, and give us your perspectives. I do realize that this is a leading question and we'll take a, accountability and acknowledge that. Um, but certainly wanted to take a moment to connect productivity with engagement, which is connected to culture. And so productivity, which is the amount of work and the quality of work that your team is getting out there, is directly connected to how engaged they are. And your engagement is basically it's measured by your culture. And so whether or not that team member believes in your culture and is aligned with your culture is how engaged they're going to be. And so, yeah, very, very high numbers. Uh, like I said, this is a leading question. Uh, certainly was expecting that. So we'll go into the next data point here. So that was kind of the positive correlation between engagement and culture. Let's look at the negative. So organizations with low engagement experienced 18% lower productivity. They saw 16% lower profitability, 37% lower job growth, and 65% lower share price over time. I certainly don't have to chat about kind of the impact, the bottom line with this group, and so I won't go on, but it does lead us into our last and final poll question, which is, have you ever thought about the cost of culture? So again, yes or no? Um, with concepts like culture, I can acknowledge that it's hard to put a definition to that. And when it's hard to put a definition to what culture is, it can be really challenging to figure out what the cost of that culture is. The good news here is that culture doesn't have to cost a lot of money. It can, it really more than anything costs time, it costs energy, and it costs communication, but it doesn't have to cost a lot of money. I will say on the other side of that, if you get your culture wrong, the impact to your bottom line and the costs associated with it are endless. And so, yeah, it looks like just about half of us have thought about culture and the cost of it. So just give you a few more moments to work through those questions. Awesome. So yeah. Similarly, employers have spent nearly $223 billion dealing just with turnover that was just associated with workplace culture. So this isn't just turnover alone. This is specifically turnover that came about because of a, the workplace culture and certainly probably a toxic workplace culture. So really appreciate that feedback and that insight into kind of how you're experiencing things. 
I wanted to kind of pivot a little bit just to give you some to, to properly introduce myself and let you know kind of why I'm qualified to be up here. My name is Ryan Watton. I'm the Chief People Officer here at XY Planning Network, and I've been with the organization just about two years. Prior to that, I was the working with an enterprise that oversaw the HR functions for about 5,000 team members. So I've done consult work with enterprises as well as startups and entrepreneurs and have really held about almost every single position within the HR industry that you can think of. Uh, beyond that, I've been a people manager for over 20 years, and so I've been navigating teams and culture and dynamics for, for most of my life. Beyond that, I am certified as a senior professional with the Society of Human Resource Management, as well as the Human Resource Certification Institute. I'm also certified as a diversity, equity, and inclusion executive, as well as a consultant in the workplace. And lastly, I have certification as critical incident stress management. I'll say beyond that, just like all of you, I have the, the perspective of a candidate, a candidate and as a team member. And so I'm standing here in front of you today because whenever I was looking for a new opportunity, I came across XY Planning Network and found that the culture very much aligned with who I am. I dissected the culture and everyone's perspective that I met on what that culture was. And you're going to see that more and more with candidates really choosing, really utilizing the interview process as a two way street, right? Really making sure that they align with their goals. And that's becoming increasingly important. So, yeah, appreciate everyone being here today. And let's jump in. So I want to just give you an, a rough overview of what you can expect for us to talk about today. I am going to take a moment to define culture and also what it isn't. We're going to talk about the fundamentals of building a positive culture. And then lastly, we're going to talk about some tools and some pro tips to foster that culture as you move along in your journey. So we'll jump right in. Company culture, above all things, is dynamic. So it's ever evolving, ever changing. We need to be excited about that and we need to be prepared for it. The Society of Human Resource Management defines it as defines it as a set of shared beliefs and values established by leaders and then communicated and reinforced, ultimately shaping employees' perceptions and behaviors. I am on a constant mission to make things more succinct, so I ultimately said that company culture sets the context for everything that we do. And so while these definitions can be helpful for some, I also acknowledge that they can be very overwhelming. That's a whole lot. So if you're saying that company culture sets the context for everything that we do, that can certainly be overwhelming. So let's pivot a little bit and talk about what company culture is not. Company culture is not a buzzword. This is not a word that's going to go away. It's not going to be something that we're not still talking about in 20 years. And the reality is, even if you want to call it something else, if you don't take a moment to define what your culture is, then you're basically giving other people the opportunity to have that narrative. And in my opinion, that can be very dangerous territory. Culture is also not a one size fits all, right? So what worked for Apple is not going to work for Google. It's not going to work for Amazon, and it's certainly not going to work for that mom and pop shop down the street. So unfortunately, this is not a copy and paste scenario. The third is that culture is not a pizza party. It's also not an ice cream social. It's not a happy hour. Um, certainly, you want to look for ways to inject fun into culture. That's a, that is a piece of it, but it is not the only piece, and it's certainly not even the major piece of what constitutes company culture. Fourth, it is not determined by one person. I'll say that there is one caveat to this. If you are an organization of one, then certainly your culture can be defined by one person. But if you, the second that you hire that second employee is the second that you give some of that accountability and ownership away of who impacts your culture and who really determines its growth. I'll say that Culture is also not one and done. So in that example with Apple, what worked for Apple certainly doesn't work for Google. But I will also say what worked for Apple three years ago is not working for Apple today. And we're really seeing that unfold real time as they're navigating the aftermath and, and kind of current math of the pandemic, as well as just some of the labor market things that I had mentioned prior. I'll lastly say that culture is not only about behaviors. It's also very much about your strategy. If your company culture does not align with your organizational strategy and where you want to go, then you're likely going to be working in different directions, which will ultimately be a very big barrier for your success. 
So now that we've defined culture, I want to talk a little bit about building culture. And so I'm acknowledge that I'm not inventing the wheel with words like mission and vision and core values, and I don't intend to. Ultimately, what I want to do is help you just think about it differently, make sure that you know what questions that each one of these should be answering, and really give you some understanding of how this impacts culture. In each one of these topics, I'm going to be talking about them separately, but each one I'm going to talk about kind of some pro tips on how to think about it. We'll go over some very specific questions that you need to be answering whenever you are going through these topics. And then lastly, we'll go over an example to really see it unfold real time. I also want to acknowledge that some of you on the call might already have a mission. You may already have your vision and core values. So if that's the case, I encourage you to take those out, compare them to what I'm saying and see if we're on the same page and see if there's opportunities to kind of to, to leverage and elevate your mission, vision and core values. So we'll jump right in with the mission. And so pro tips, you want to keep it concise and you want to keep it digestible. If people don't read what you have to say, then they won't know it and they won't understand it. The best practice here is about one to two sentences. I will say that some organizations will write manifestos, they'll write essays. And certainly if that speaks to your culture, then so be it. But you do need to be aware that there is a risk of alienating some of your audience from reading it. And again, if they don't read it, then they don't know or understand it. Second, this is a really great opportunity for you to spotlight your differentiator. What makes you different from the crowd, right? Why should people come to you? This is a great opportunity for you to define it for yourself, but also for your team and for your clients that you're serving. And lastly, I'll say that you want to align the team, the mission statement, and really all of the things that we're talking about today is really getting folks centered around a common goal, a common purpose, so that no matter who you're talking about to or what you're talking about, everyone knows what the underlying theme of what you do is. So when we talk about questions that have to be answered by a positive and good mission statement, it is what is our business, right? Why are we here? How are we doing it, right? What are the steps that we're taking? Who do we do it for? Who is our target audience? And why do we exist, right? This is the big picture. So let's take a look, excuse me, at the example of XY Planning Network's niche focus, which is ultimately our mission statement. We are an ecosystem that enables entrepreneurship for fee-for-service financial planners. So when we take a look at those pro tips and we take a look at those questions that need to be answered. Is this concise? Yeah, absolutely. This is 10 words. Very digestible. Does it explain what our differentiator is? Yeah, we are here for fee-for-service financial planners. And we does it say what we do? Absolutely. It says that we are an ecosystem. We want to enable entrepreneurship. Does it say why we exist? Absolutely. Put it all together. And that's what's here. Who is it for? It's for those fee-for-service financial planners. So in all of those questions that need to be answered, as well as the pro tips, this mission statement and niche focus does a really great job of that. So moving along, we'll talk about the vision statement. You want to talk kind of, you want to look into the future. So our mission statement is kind of where we are at currently. The vision statement is where we want to be. And so you want to look into the future. About five to 10 years is the common theme here. And so you want to be tangible, but you also want to be aspirational. And I know that can be challenging. Um, so we'll look at the example here in a few slides to really see how that can be successful. Second, you want to connect it to the mission. If you aren't connecting your mission and vision, then you're basically asking your audience to do that. And if you're asking your audience to do that, chances are they may not get it right. And so you don't want to be, you don't want that to happen. So certainly make sure that those are connected. And third, similar to the mission statement, you want to be precise with your language. You want to be clear, you want to be concise, and you want to make sure that you're not relying heavily on jargon just because this has several different audiences. And one last pro tip is that uh, it's a little bit um, not, cogn or not intuitive, but you want to make these vision statements in present tense. So if we look at an example, or excuse me, the questions that need to be answered are what does success look like? What is our purpose? What are the goals, both tangible and aspirational? And what do we offer as an organization? So if we look at XY Planning Network's core target and purpose, ours is to offer a full suite of business solutions with 1,000 team members serving 5,000 members by the end of 2028. We help people live their great lives. And so when we look at the things that I just talked about, 
does this look into the future? Absolutely, it's very specific, right? This is what we want to accomplish by 2028. Does it connect it to the mission? Absolutely. Is it precise? Yeah, you can't get much more precise than those very specific tangible numbers. But also this is what success looks like. It looks like we have a large community with a full suite of things that are really solving those problems that our financial planners may be experiencing on a daily or monthly basis. It was really specific about what our what our goals are, and it also speaks to what our purpose is as an organization. My favorite piece uh, as the guy that works with human resources and people is we help people live their great life. This is something that no matter what a person does within this organization, we can get behind. So our department, People and Culture, for example, works internally, but we help team members live their best lives so that team members can help members live their best lives so that members can in turn help their clients live their best life. And so I very much believe that this is a really positive example of a vision statement at work. So lastly, of these three concepts, we're going to talk about core values. So I would encourage you when you're looking at your core values to think holistically. Like I said previously, you have so many stakeholders. You have the communities that you're working in. You have your clients. You have your team members. You have your leadership team. You have the vendors and partners that you're working with. So you definitely want to make sure that you're looking at core values in a holistic way so that you can make sure that it speaks to every angle of your organization. Second, you don't want to be bland. This is not a time for you to be just like everyone else. And so I encourage you to really think about words that you can use and phrases that you can use. I put a very specific example here saying use one word, use, using one word values like integrity should be avoided. And I'll explain a little bit of, of why. One is the word integrity very specifically is hard to define. Uh, everyone has a different definition of what integrity looks like. And so if you're saying that, you run the risk of people having different ideas of what your culture and what matters to you are. Additionally, if you are trying to be a differentiator, integrity, I would venture to guess, is probably on 20 to 40% of the core values list out there, including Enron, for what it's worth. So you certainly want to make sure that you are looking at words that make sense, that are easily definable, and that really speak to you in your unique workplace. And lastly, I'll say you want to avoid acronyms. Acronyms can be catchy, which is uh, super helpful when you're trying to remember things, and, and that's certainly key. But I would say that they're very restrictive. To me personally, they come off as kitschy and outdated, and the results can be disjointed. At the end of the day, your values should be defining your values, not a letter of the alphabet. So you definitely want to try to avoid acronyms whenever possible. Questions answered are, what values are unique to your firm? What values should guide your firm? How should the team conduct themselves? And what values speak to your moral compass? So just like before, we'll take a look at the examples that we have here internally. And so I'm not going to go over all of these verbatim, but I just want to quickly touch on what they are and kind of some of the things that we mentioned earlier. So do the right thing, get shit done, mission driven, win together, lose together, and be well-being you are our core values here at XY Planning Network. And so we believe that mission driven certainly speaks to a holistic audience, right? If we're looking at these and asking ourselves, do we believe these are bland? Absolutely not, right? And so get shit done is a core value that I have literally never seen or heard of anywhere else in the country. And so that is a differentiator for us. I'll give you some insider intel. Um, when we were as a company looking at our core values and what mattered to us, integrity was actually one of the words that came and, and really made it almost all the way through the process. But again, it was something that was difficult for all of us to get to a common definition of. And so we chose do the right thing. It still speaks to what we were saying with integrity, but for us, it really matches who we are as a brand. It matches our tone. And so you'll see on this page that you're not seeing a lot of one word core values, and that's intentional. We want to make sure that it's ours and that people understand it. And because of that, we've also added a, a little bit of a definition so people are crystal clear on what it is we expect. And we see these roll out probably more than your mission and more than your vision statement. You're going to see these as a constant, regular conversation throughout the organization. And people want to hold on to them. And that's what you want to see. It's a really good example of the core values there as well. So we're going to pivot a little bit and talk about fostering culture. 
Um, you've done all of that work. And so what are you going to do to continue the conversation in a positive way and in an intentional way? So you have to communicate the culture. I would argue that this is the biggest piece. You know, you've done a lot of the groundwork. You've put that into action. What you don't want to do is put it into a manual and put that on a shelf to collect dust. You have to figure out and be intentional ways to communicate this within your organization. And so I've identified a few ways here for you, um, but you certainly want to make this part of the integration process. When a new team member comes into your organization, this has to be a conversation that you were talking about and it needs to be an intentional one. And I'll give you some examples on the next slide of this in, in action. Second, you wanna tie recognition. So if I'm saying, hey, Amy, um, you did a really great job on the prospect uh, call today. I want to connect that with getting shit done because I know my, how much work that she put into this, right? And so that's a really meaningful way of not only giving her recognition and positive feedback, but tying it to a core value so that she can keep that top of mind. And ideally what you want to see is that Amy in turn is also living that value and also kind of recognizing others for values as well. And third, similarly with motivation, if you have positive feedback coming from your external clients, and you are talking to the folks internally about it, which you should, you also want to tie that to here's a really positive way that you have shown the core values or you are living the mission or you are helping us to get to our vision. And so as promised, I wanted to give you some examples of that and how that rolls out real time here at XY Planning Network. So in that first top left visual, we have a Slack message from Maddie Roche, who is the Senior Director of Member Success. And here she's highlighting a back uh, behind the scenes team member. And you can see there, she's hashtag two of our core values. That is absolutely what you wanna see. You wanna see your leadership really just identifying for folks. Hey, here's a really positive thing that you did. Let's continue that positive behavior. This is how it aligns with who we are. That example just below that is from Avery Hines. He is an intern here on our tax team. And he has gone to his private social media account on LinkedIn to talk about something that he's created. And as you can see there, he's also hashtagged be well being you. That is 100% what we wanna see. We wanna see people keeping these values, our mission, our vision, our culture, top of mind, and really kind of celebrating moments where we're doing that. And then there on the, on the right side, you'll see that there is a team member welcome guide. And so this is the team member, one page of the team member welcome guide that goes to all of our team members before they even step foot into the organization. So before they even get here, they know these core values matter to us. They know exactly what they are and they know that it's likely gonna come up in conversation. And so this is a really good example of how we get that into, into we kind of inject culture in right, right from the get-go. So you also wanna drive and assess engagement. So you have to constantly be touching points with where your culture's at and how your team members are doing. So some ways to get culture buy-in is to, and to really drive engagement in culture is to make sure that you're checking in. At the beginning of this presentation, I kind of mentioned that culture doesn't have to cost a lot of money, but it will take time, it will take energy, and it takes communication. So if you're meeting on a weekly basis, you should be intentional about when, you're, when you meet, how many of those conversations are going to be about productivity? How much of they're going to be about progress and growth? And how are you tying that into the culture? But you need to be thinking strategically about how you're going to do that. The second one is leadership. Leadership should always be living the values and they should always be living your culture. You have two options if that's not happening for you. One is you need to go back to the drawing table and reassess and reevaluate what your culture is and the values that support it. The other option is, is you need to reevaluate your leadership team and really determine if they're in the right seats and if they're going to be able to push you forward. And lastly, I would say that you have to connect individuals to the culture. So Amy and I and every team member that needs that works here needs to know how we are supporting this mission, how we are helping this organization get to the vision and where we want to be and how we're utilizing those core values in this culture to really champion that experience and make sure that we're heading in the right direction and doing the right thing. So I don't, I unfortunately don't have a lot of time to go over engagement. This is a, honestly a presentation in and of itself, but this is something that I wanted to kind of share with you. It's a really great resource uh, industry-wide and really across industries. Gallup 12 has been the best 
resource that I have found that really helps us engage or excuse me, measure engagement and culture and whether it's positive. And so it asks 12 specific questions. If you Google it, um, you'll be able to find lots of resources on this as well as videos on these questions as well and why these specific questions. So much research went into this. Um, but yeah, it's asking questions like, do you know what is expected? Do you have the resources? Do you have the opportunity to do what you do best? Are you being recognized regularly? Do people care about you at work? Are they encouraging your development? Do your opinions seem to count? And, and this one's, this next one is very important to what we're talking about. Does the mission and purpose of your company make you feel your job is important? Also, are your associates committed to doing quality work? Do they have a best friend at work? Are you talking about your progress and do you have opportunities to learn and grow? So all of these questions really help us understand better where we're at in the culture. And it also helps us to determine what next steps we might need to take to moving the needle in a positive direction. And lastly, I'll just talk about defending your culture. You've spent so much time navigating, you're communicating this, you're building it and you're fostering it, right? But you need to make sure that you are setting up defense points around your organization. So first I would empower and encourage every single team member within your organization to defend the culture and the values that really define who you are and what you do. You also need to act swiftly. You have to address threats immediately because when you don't, you basically are giving it a voice saying that it's okay. In this situation, maybe these values don't matter or really, yeah, we might be going in the wrong direction and that's you know counterproductive to the vision, but we, we need to be making sure that we're acting very swiftly and that we are being candidly and really creating a culture of feedback where that candor can come both ways uh, from bottom to top and top to bottom uh, and, and side to side laterally, right? Lastly, I'll say that you have to assess. So similarly to what I was saying with the engagement, we also assess each individual employee here against our core values to make sure that not only are they meeting those, those expectations, but they're exceeding them. And also highlighting opportunities for us to better support them as leadership. So this is these three things are really the best way for you to defend the culture that you've done such a great job of building. And so look, I know that we have chatted about a lot and I definitely wanna leave room for Q and A here because I know there's a lot of great questions. Um, but I want you to really make sure that you're leaving with at least three takeaways. And one is, is that culture is dynamic, right? As I mentioned, what's what happened three years ago is not necessarily going to work for us now. And so we need to be excited about that and we need to be cognizant of it. And we need to be looking out for those, those kind of warning signs and those telltales that maybe our culture needs a little bit of support, right? Or a little bit of defending. You also want to make sure that you're communicating really whether we're talking about culture or not anything that has to do with people you need to be communicating the reality is if in every organization that i've worked with one of the major pain points has always been around communication right making sure that you are getting the the necessary information and messaging to the team member while you're cutting down the noise but when it comes to culture you know this is no different communication is so integral to a positive experience and lastly, culture is your narrative. This is your opportunity to really define what it is that you want and where you want to be. And if you don't take this opportunity, then ultimately you're giving others control of your narrative. And like I said prior at the very beginning of this, that is a very dangerous place to be. So that was kind of concludes the presentation for me. I'm going to have Amy help me along with the Q&A. Definitely super excited about all the questions that you have and will do my best to answer them. I will also say that I have put my contact information, both my email address as well as my LinkedIn. So after this presentation is concluded, um, if you have any follow-up questions, feel free to ask me and I'll do my best to answer those as well. Great, Ryan. Lots of wonderful things to think about there. So we had uh, plenty of questions that were submitted beforehand. So we'll get started with those. So Ryan, what do you find to be an effective way to communicate culture and vision to someone who is just joining an existing team? Yeah, that's a really great question. You know, I think I touched on it a little bit. It's, it's really being intentional. So for us, what we do here and really helping define what the culture is, is you'll see that in our job descriptions, right? So if you take a look at any XY planning job description, it's very specific on who we are as a company. And we are very cognizant of the brand and the tone and the, and the words that we're using. 
We also put our policies and procedures manual, which highlights what our core values are in that job description. So really anyone has access to those. And as I mentioned before, we also send welcome packets that define those culture. And within that first week, we were talking about it. And beyond that, you know, their direct leadership has to be cognizant of, of that person's experience and really keep that top of mind in those one-on-ones. And so I think those are all really great ways to, to integrate folks positively into your culture. Yeah, absolutely. And there was fun stuff too. I remember when I started, you know, I got decals, sticker decals that had all the different uh, mission statements that we have and the values that we have to get to put wherever I wanted. And like my key card for the office has be well being you want it. You know, there's just lots of little reminders also. That totally. come up. Perfect. So is culture top down or bottom up? That is a really great question. I think the majority of folks believe that it is, it's, uh, top down. I think one of the statistics that I have seen is that 70% of folks believe that it's actually their direct supervisor who really defines their individual culture. But I would argue that it happens all over the place, right? Ideally, like in, in many of the examples that I've shown, we want that to be happening laterally. We want folks to be, we want that culture of feedback where folks are uh, specialists are, are kind of challenging their managers, right, to make sure that the culture is being lived and that if there is a danger to that, or if we see someone within the organization kind of maybe not living a value that they're being called out. And so all of that to say, I think it, it's really multi-directional. Great. What are some techniques for gauging employee workloads and delegating new duties to them? Yeah, I mean, workload is a really challenging subject, certainly as we are kind of in this remote world. I think some techniques, you know, there there are some surveys out there that we are actually employing here, um, and I can get those. <clears throat> I don't have those available to me right now, Amy, but maybe you and, and the marketing team can help me mm -hmm. get those out to the participants. But um, ultimately, surveys just, just speak to burnout and workload. But I think ultimately, you have to, again, create an environment where people are allowed to speak candidly with you. And you have to ask those hard questions. It isn't enough, Amy, to just say, you know, do you need help? Really, when you ask that question, most people don't know how to articulate. And certainly if they're in an overloaded spot, they can't be bothered with trying to figure that out as well, right? And so I think really making time for it, making intentional time and say, saying, what is it that you're working on? Help me better understand. The reality here too, is that you have to figure out how to help them prioritize. And so that's where the vision and the mission and the core values come to play, right? So if we know that this thing that you're working on doesn't ultimately help us meet our vision, then, then maybe we're not working on the right thing. And so that can certainly be part of making sure that people understand what their workload is, what's important so that they aren't taking on too much or taking on things that maybe don't matter. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, well, at XYPM, we do the weekly happiness survey, which asks questions about workload. And I think for me personally, even if I don't fill it out every week, it's just a nice piece of um, helping me know like it's there every week. So if I do start to feel I know where to go exactly. So just having like structure in place for that is super helpful just for me as an employee. Yeah. And I, I love that you mentioned that, Amy. You know, it is something that we do. And, and it's really important to have intentional ways for to to get that feedback, right? And and mm -hmm. so we have here at XY, like you said, anonymous tools to do that. We also have unanonymous tools to do that. And so I will just say too, if you are going to have a survey like that, or you're going to be soliciting information, you should always make sure that you are going back and following up on here's what I'm here's what that information was, and here's what we plan to do with it. You right because if people feel like they're just putting information out into the ether and no one's going to read it, guess what? You're going to get less information. So. Absolutely. So helpful. So this kind of ties into that. So how to build a culture in a flexible uh, office environment. So this person commented that their business only requires staff to attend the office two days a week. So how can you still build this when people you're not seeing people every day? That's a really great question. And one I don't have, you know, a blanket answer for, unfortunately, or else I would uh, probably be a billionaire at this point. But it's certainly uh, certainly something that we're all kind of navigating. And what I would say 
is that you have to really speak to your the folks that work within your organization. But above all things, I think one of the challenges that we have with remote work is that when we all get together, it's usually very much work oriented, right? We're coming for a very specific purpose and then we're kind of losing that unintentional collaboration. We're losing that water cooler talk and we're really even just losing those nonverbals, right? Those things that we are seeing our, our coworkers doing that maybe we wouldn't have noticed otherwise. And so I would say the biggest piece with remote workforces is, is looking for opportunities to get them connected both at work or, or for work, I should say, and for non-work opportunities, right? Like creating events, which you know, Amy, we're doing mm -hmm. a lot of um, because we, we realize that there's just information that comes around and, and ideas that come around uh, that are really more unintentional. And so you have to create kind of these virtual water cooler places. So, Absolutely. How do you balance employee benefits with making a healthy bottom line? Yeah, that is, that is a really great question. So I'll say we, we, one of our core values is be well being you. So we very much try to speak to benefits that answer answer that core value for our team members. For us, yeah, I mean, the, with every organization, you have to be cognizant of the bottom line. But the reality is there's a lot of benefits that you can provide that don't cost a lot of money. Some things that we do here uh, when it comes to wellness are we have rocket lawyer, right? So we can help with legal assistance. And that's actually something that we have been able to provide free for our team members. Um, we also have the Calm app, which is, you know, pretty limited. It's it's $30 a month. And that really just helps folks have tools and resources at the ready to be able to navigate those. Um, but I will also say that it is super important to keep your finger on the pulse of it, right? You don't need to just have as many benefits as you can possibly think of. You have to have the right benefits in place. Um, and so really constantly evaluating it and, and not being afraid to kind of take things off the table if it's not working for you. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So we have a question in um, the Q&A module from Billy Walsh. So how do you convince leadership and managers to stop and think about culture if they're so focused just on doing the work and like increasing production? Yeah, you know, I think the biggest way to do this is to role model it, right? So this this is where I would say it needs to come from top down. Um, so the, the CEO really needs to be the one who's really driving culture. If you have a CPO, certainly that will help as well. But you have to really make time for it. Otherwise, you have to be intentional and in blocking times for that. And so here at XY, ways that we've done that is we've created, um, we've taken learning and development opportunities and had the entire staff come together to talk about some of these tough topics, right? And so for us, diversity, equity, and inclusion is such a huge, valuable piece of what we do. And so we had four folks come in and just last month and they didn't they didn't talk to any of us amy as you know they didn't talk to us about work they talked to us about kind of their experience in montana as black women right and and so yes that was only an hour and a half and it's not work production but it is a, a time for all of us to get together over a common topic and really just concentrate on things that are are really integral to the culture beyond that within every retreat so we meet quarterly so we make specific time for all of the managers to get together and again we're talking about about culture uh, uh lastly i'll say with our performance evaluations that we ha do on a biannual basis here a lot of those questions are very much geared around culture and making sure that team members are allowed to give us their their perspectives but also we are asking very leading questions to make sure that we are forcing conversations about these topics with with managers and their direct teams so great that's super helpful next we have uh most of these ideas generally seem to be for larger firms are there ways to scale down to a smaller firm this person clarifies that they only have three people in their firm yeah, you know, I think a lot of the things that I mentioned are still going to be valuable uh, for a three person firm. I would say that with three people, it's actually going to be a lot easier to kind of create this culture. It's just, again, making sure that they feel like they're a piece of it, they're a part of it, and that you're open to their feedback. Um, and really just, again, you know, with when we're talking about scaling it down, 
You can still have performance reviews that have very specific questions that speak to your culture. You can still meet on a regular basis and, and have that you know monthly touch point where you're saying, hey, I want to talk to you about your performance. I want to talk to you about progress. I want to talk to you about opportunities. And really just interweave you know, and that fabric of culture into those questions and conversations is, is kind of where I would go with that. Great. Let's see. So where do I find an industry survey of salaries per region? It's a little bit of a pivot, but still, I think, within your wheelhouse. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so there's a lot of resources out there. If you're looking to pay for a survey, which can get pretty expensive, you can find those in with Radford, Aon, or Mercer are all some of the leading ones that, uh, in our industry and really industries across the country. And so it can give you a lot of really specific intel into proper compensation geographically. It can also kind of depending on your, on the size of your organization. So lots of really good information there, but that can get into thousands and thousands of dollars. So if you're looking for kind of a free resource, um, the ones that I would suggest would be salary.com. Uh, Glassdoor is starting to have that information. Uh, LinkedIn and Indeed are also good, good places to look as well. Great. So here's kind of a what not to do. What are the main things you see a company do that sabotages the company culture? Yeah, that's a real that's a really good question. Um, yeah, some of the things that I quite honestly, the biggest thing is when decisions are made or actions are made that go specifically against the, the core values in the mission and vision. If you have done a successful job in hiring folks that align with your culture when that happens they will be impacted by it and ultimately you've lost respect you've lost um, credibility and once you kind of lose that it becomes very 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 challenging to kind of correct and and, it, and sometimes can take years and sometimes it isn't correctable and i'm not saying that it isn't correctable for for a company but the way that that team member perceives you may not be something that you can correct and if you if you if you have that kind of relationship ultimately they will become a detractor for you and, and and to no fault of their own so really it's just making sure that leaders are putting their money where their where their uh, culture is <laughs> absolutely so this ties in well to that so how do you source those folks that are going to be a good culture fit for you yeah, I, I, you know, as you know, Amy, our interview process is very long and that's intentional um, <laughs> because we want to make sure that we are giving lots of folks opportunities to really show off their skill set. But we are also constantly saying, will they be an addition to our culture? Um, and I, I will take a moment just to talk about the difference between culture fit and culture addition. So culture fit is this kind of mentality like we want people to be just like us. And that is really dangerous rhetoric. You want to make sure that you're being mindful of that because there is an opportunity for you to have this unconscious bias, right? Because whether or not I want to have a beer with you really doesn't tell me whether or not you're going to do a good job, right? And so I'm really always looking at how who's going to elevate our culture, who's going to help us get to our vision is how you should be thinking. But for us, we, again, in our job descriptions are very mindful and intentional with creating a, creating a brand of who we are. Mm -hmm. As you know, we also have TA interviews. Uh, that's talent acquisition interviews. That's my team does that. We also have hiring manager interviews. We have work samples. We have peer interviews. And we also have an executive interview. And in all of those situations, culture is part of the conversation. If they're not asking those questions, uh, then we will be asking those questions and really defining and going against what it is. And I've seen time and time again, Amy, where we had multiple candidates or maybe two candidates that were like, neck and neck and really what brought them to us is their ability to speak to our culture and who we are and where we're at right now yeah absolutely and i'll add that in my like i think it's still part of our interview process that you know we did videos at the start yeah. and that was mind-blowing to me i'm sure that's not as innovative as i feel like it is but <laughs> that's such a great way you know to see really see someone at first and just get a good feel for their personality like from the beginning totally great so um what are the oh sorry um how to create a great culture in a fully remote environment so we've kind of talked about if you're doing a little bit of both so what if it's just completely remote yeah i mean similar to the same the question prior you know it really is just 
creating opportunities for people to connect outside of just some work or just some project or some common problem. I would honestly say that having a fully remote work environment is much easier than having a hybrid environment when it comes to culture and really things across the board because you stop having that kind of binary, you know, them versus us, like we're the remote, we're, we're not. And so, and, and with that hybrid scenario, one of the challenges that we're all experiencing with this is it's, you almost have to have different approaches for each one. Right. And so that can also feed into this otherness. And so, um, yeah, with, if it's fully remote, um, I almost feel like that makes it easier because, because all, all you have is, is that remote environment. And so again, just making sure that you're connecting folks, um, outside of work, but you're also connecting them on projects. I think a really good opportunity and, and meaningful way to get folks around the culture is to do exercises around, around the culture and the core values and really just kind of trying to, to uh, identify ways for them to collaborate on, on such projects together. Great. Thank you. Ooh, I like this one. How do you rehabilitate a culture that has been damaged by a toxic hire that is now no longer at the company or a culture mismatch from a merger? That's a, a great question. So when we're talking about triaging, right, I, I would say that you need to be consistent. You always want to make sure that however you, uh, the expectations that you have are the expectations you have across the organization. Um, I would also say that you want, you have to be transparent, right? Um, if you aren't, people will see right through it. If you are kind of going forward with an unwarranted hope, you know, or an unwarranted optimism, they're going to see right through that. And that's not ultimately what they need. They need to be able to trust you. And so they have the only way for you to do that is to really be transparent. You want to be candid. And, and, and lastly, Amy, I would say that you would want to show humility there, right? Humility goes so, so far in really defining leadership and cultures in a meaningful way. So when you show humility versus unwarranted optimism, you're showing that, hey, we're identifying and, and we're highlighting that this was a misstep on our part and we're pivoting to get back to our culture. And that's ultimately, you know, taking that opportunity to say, this is why our culture exists so that we have that guiding light. And so really, there is an opportunity to frame that in a way of, hey, yeah, we misstepped, but there, and we, but we realized that there was a problem, and we're fixing it, and and we want your buy-in and your and your help in and making sure that we continue on that course. Yeah, absolutely. Let's see. So, where have other firms placed their job opportunities for best visibility? Can you repeat the question, Amy? Yeah, yeah. Where have other firms placed their job opportunities for best vis visibility? So do you find success on Indeed or? Got it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we're all kind of using the same platforms. And the reality is, is that with how many people there are in this country and how many jobs, you know, like I said, 11 million came out just in January. We are all using the same tool. So I would say, depending on the positions that you're going for and kind of who they're looking at, LinkedIn is always going to be a big one for our communities and our firms. Um, Indeed is another big one. I would say that you should be cognizant about really trying to figure out how you can hire folks that aren't exactly like you, right? Because with that diversity of feedback and, and background comes, you know, different perspectives. And that's always good for a firm. So I would also encourage you to look at local chapters, uh, you know, so uh, uh, of firms and, and just folks that might help you get connected with BIPOC communities, for example, which is Black, Indigenous, and people of color. We also use Handshake, uh, which is a platform that is connected to almost every university in the country. That's been very successful for us for entry level positions, as well as our internship program. So that's a really good opportunity to do that as well. Um, you should try to get connected with your local HR um, community. In every single community, there is a Society of Human Resource Management chapter that can really help get you connected as well with uh, folks who are looking in, in the in your communities. And if, if you are in person, I would also say, don't be afraid to have an open house, right? That's a good way to not only get clients, prospective clients into your space, but also think of to get prospective team members and people who are just interested. And then lastly, I would say, 
try to get connected with folks in your fields in the universities that you, in the communities that you work with. Yeah, super helpful. I also make a tiny little plug for our VAP Facebook group. Um, you don't have to be a member to do that. And they there is a specific day where folks can post job opportunities. You know, that's a group of lots of people in the industry. So maybe they're not the right fit. They might know someone that is. Absolutely. Lovely. Okay. So um, what is the best way to measure the status of company culture? So you, know, you talked about like the Gallup survey, um, you know, other maybe some other resources for how to measure engagement. Yeah. And again, this is, this is a very challenging one to really put specific measurements to. And so honestly, the, the one that I shared is the major, major tool that I've always used. Um, again, there's opportunities if you go through that platform you don't necessarily have to right you can ask those questions whenever you want but if you went with gallup there's also opportunities to kind of plug in very specific questions around the culture um, when we're talking about measuring culture too again performance reviews is a natural time to do that your your monthly one-on-ones weekly one-on-ones is a is an opportunity to do that but really it's just just really look for as many ways that you can inject it. But when we're, when you're measuring it, I'd say that the only other piece of advice that I have is really just asking your team members, how are you feeling about these core values? What core value really speaks to you and why, right? And, and again, looking for ways maybe in the candidate experience, there's another one to when you when you're looking at all the candidates, you can also do kind of a follow-up survey to see how they felt that their experience was. And, and maybe how they would correlate that with, with the culture, at least from their perspective. I would also encourage you to maybe just go around to all of the team members that work in your organization to just ask them to define what they believe your culture is. And if they're all saying the same thing, that's a really positive sign. If they're all very different, uh, then there may be some work to do there. Great. Okay, I think we got time for just a couple more. So how do you move an employee out without legal, legal ramifications who is a bad cultural fit? So if someone isn't meeting your core values I, and, and you are looking at kind of transitioning them out of the organization, there's a few things that you want to do to avoid legal ramifications. One is you want to document, right? You want to document specifically with that team member. And it isn't just you documenting it, it's you having a conversation with that team member so that you've made them aware that they're not meeting your values or not meeting your culture, right? And so that's kind of goes back to a few slides back where I was saying you have to address it immediately. Mm -hmm. And so time is of the essence. So that's kind of your first step is really creating documentation of this. And really what you're looking for whenever you're talking about whether or not a team member makes sense for your organization, is are, is there a pattern of this? Is there an inability for them to correct those behaviors? And then also document that. Again, culture can be really hard to define, but if they aren't following your culture and they're not working towards your vision, then the reality is that they probably aren't doing a good job. So you're gonna be able to find some tangibles there. And so connect it to really specific things that they are not meeting, certain expectations they're not meeting, and then you want to give them kind of an improvement plan. Here's what I'd like to see in the next month. Be specific about when you're going to follow up. Be specific about what success looks like. And if they aren't able to meet it and you have that documentation and their signatures on those things, then being able to, to kind of have that final conversation saying, hey, you know, we've tried, we've, we've retrained, we've provided those resources, but ultimately you weren't able to get there. And so we will be kind of terminating your your employment with the company because of culture. I, I think that you would be, well, I know that you would be legally safe if you went through those those steps. Great, thanks, Ryan. So one more quick one maybe, do you have a favorite resource if someone wants to learn more about you know, providing excellent culture to their firm? Um, do you have a blog or a podcast or a book something people can look into? Yeah, you know, there's a lot. So I really love the book Powerful by Patty McCord. So she she and I very much align. She was the CPO of Netflix. And so that's a really incredible book. I also love the book Inclusify. I want to say it's Stephanie Johnson um, is the author of that. But that really speaks to why diversity, equity, and inclusion is so meaningful. And, and really, people 
we as a we as a country like to tie diversity and inclusion together, but inclusion really is separate. And it's not something that just one identity group wants over the other. Everybody wants to belong, but everybody wants to stand out. And she does a really good job of kind of creating uh, the narrative around that and how it impacts culture. Awesome. Thanks so much, Ryan. Well, we are almost to the top of the hour here. So just want to mention real quick that if you're interested in having a conversation with a member of the XYPN sales team, we'll put a link in the chat for you to schedule that. Also, when you click back to the lobby, you'll see a feedback survey pop up when you leave the webinar. So if you'll just take a moment to fill that out, we would really appreciate hearing what you thought. And then that's going to be it for us today. So thank you everyone for joining us. We just really enjoyed having you and we would love to see you back here again next month. Have a great rest of